Hey everyone and welcome back to Clinical Physio with me, Khalid Maidan. In today's video, we're going to be taking you through all you need to know about active range of movement testing for the lumbar spine. We're going to show you how to do these tests, the key muscles involved, and also some little tips here and there that you might be able to use to reduce your patient's pain when you're testing their active range of movement, which will of course give you an idea on how best to treat them. If you're not quite familiar with why we test active range of movement, you can head over to our video titled Why We Test Active Range of Movement, which gives you the full clinical reasoning behind why we do what we do. And when we're testing active range of movement, there are three key things we need to consider. P, Q and R, which stands for pain, quality and range. If you're not familiar with P, Q and R, here's a quick recap. If you do know what we're talking about, then head on through to the next stage of the video. So as we have said, when testing active range of movement of any joint, we need to consider P, Q and R. P for pain, Q for quality of movement, and R for range of movement. In terms of pain, if pain is present, we know that there is a dysfunction within this movement, which may be causing our patient's problem, and will likely direct further testing to this area to try and isolate the source of the pain. If pain is not elicited as part of the examination, the therapist can move on to the next stage. For example, if there is no pain on active lumbar spine movements during a hip examination, the lumbar spine can be ruled out of the initial investigation. In terms of quality, good quality indicates that the brain and local tissue are both happy and able to perform the movement. So what does that look like? It means that the patient will look very willing to move and have sufficient power in movement with good control and coordination. If these are lacking during the movement, quality can be questions, and thus likely direct further testing to establish why the movement is of poor quality. For example, weakness, which could be due to a myotomal weakness from a spinal pathology, or a deconditioned muscle from the local area. In terms of range of movement, too much or too little range can indicate a dysfunction within the movement, and could also help us identify the patient's condition. As a therapist, it is always important to use the range values within your movement test as objective markers and for you to compare the specific range values in each treatment session. It is important to note the range at which your patient's pain starts and the range at which the movement ends, as often these two values will be very different. For example, if we only measured the movement at which pain starts, we do not actually know how much range the patient can achieve. Essentially, a lack of range indicates that there is a stiffness or a weakness which is preventing full movement. So here's a quick video just to demonstrate exactly what happens at the lumbar spine when your patient is going through their lumbar spine movements. Let's start with flexion. So when we flex the lumbar spine, we will see that the facet joints become open. Therefore, if you have a patient where you suspect they have a joint irritation or a degenerative lumbar spine, you may find that they prefer a flex position because this is where the compression on the facet joint is released. However, what this movement does do is place more anterior pressure on the vertebral body. This can translate your uh, patient's lumbar spine discs posteriorly, which can therefore cause them to impinge or irritate nerves and nerve roots. Next, let's have a look at extension. So when we extend the lumbar spine, the facet joints close down, as you can see here. So therefore, your patient with a facet joint irritation or a degenerative lumbar spine will not be happy going into extension because this is where the facet joints are being compressed. Next, let's look at side flexion. So whenever you side flex, the side that you are flexing towards will be where the facet joints close down and the side that you are flexing away from, the facet joints will open up. So for example, if we take side flexion towards the left side, we will see that the facet joints on the left side of the lumbar spine will close down, and those on the right side, like you can see here, will open up. So if left side flexion is causing your patient's pain, this may be due to an irritated facet joint compression. Finally, let's consider combined movements. For example, if we consider the combined movement of extension and side flexion, we can see that extension will close down the facet joints to a certain degree, but then side flexing it towards uh, the left, for example, will increase more facet joint compression on the left side. Overall, once again, I'd like you to remember all of these different movements so, and the things that happen at the lumbar spine during these movements, so when your patient is going through your testing, you can work out their pathology perhaps a little bit more. So now we're going to take you through lumbar spine active range of movement in terms of flexion. 
For this, our patient is going to be standing. As the therapist, we may choose to stand directly to the side of the patient so that we can observe whether or not the flexion is coming from the thoracic spine, the lumbar spine, or the hips. Or we may choose to stand directly behind the patient just to get things from a different perspective. For example, does our patient rotate as they go into lumbar spine flexion? So for the movement, we're going to ask our patient to put their hands on the front of their thighs and then slide their hands down their legs as far as they feel comfortable. If your patient has reported that lumbar spine flexion is an aggravating factor in their subjective assessment, but when you go through lumbar, lumbar spine flexion like so, it doesn't reproduce their pain, you may uh, choose to go through repeated flexion, i.e. asking your patient to flex six to ten times, as this may reproduce their pain. So, here are the muscles that are involved in the movement for lumbar spine flexion on the screen for you to see. Okay, so now we're going to go through our P, Q, and R. First P, which stands for pain. Lumbar spine flexion is a multifactorial movement involving muscles, bones, ligaments, nerve tissue. So it may be difficult to hone in on ex which exact structure is causing your patient's symptoms. However, it's generally known that disc pathologies don't like lumbar spine flexion, whereas arthrogenic uh, conditions may like lumbar spine flexion, because this is where the facet joints open during the movement. Whatever uh, we find during the movement, just knowing that lumbar spine flexion reproduces your patient's pain can tell you that their condition is related to the lumbar spine itself. Next, on to Q for quality. You're now going to see a range of different videos that we've taken demonstrating different quality for lumbar spine flexion. Here's the first one where our patient is flexing th excessively through the thoracic spine, which means that the lumbar spine remains quite stiff and rigid. In the second video, you can see that the patient is flexing predominantly through their hips, which is good, that's what we want. Lumbar spine flexion should be a combination of uh, flexion from the lumbar spine and from the hips. And finally, you'll see a video of our patient bending their knees when they go into lumbar spine flexion. Often this is because the hamstrings are too tight and your patient feels they need to slacken the hamstrings in order to gain more movement. Finally, on to range. If you want the exact degrees, we're often looking at between 40 and 60 for a normal population. However, therapists often like to use landmarks around the body uh, to demonstrate your patient's range of movement. So, for example, we can ask our patient here to flex down to the tibial tuberosity. We consider that the normal population can reach somewhere between the tibial tuberosity and the toes. That's what we may consider for the normal population. However, you'll find that other populations may be able to reach further. For example, those are, who are gymnasts or those who are hypermobile may commonly be able to actually place their hands flat on the floor with the knees extended. Finally, however your patient does move, you may choose to see if you can change it and see if this changes their symptoms. For example, let's say they bend excessively through the thoracic spine and this causes pain around the thoracolumbar region. You could ask to see if your patient can flex more through the hips and through the pelvis and this may take the pressure off the thoracic spine. That's just an example, but whatever way you look at it, this might be a tool for you to use and it might be a solution for how you can improve their symptoms. So now we're going to look at active lumbar spine extension. Again, for this movement, our patient will be standing. And as we said for lumbar spine flexion, the therapist may choose to stand directly laterally to the patient so they could see exactly how they are extending. Or they may choose to stand directly behind so they can look at things from a different perspective, for example, rotation, as we mentioned with flexion. So, for this movement, we're going to ask our patient to put their hands on their hips or on their pelvis for a little bit of support, and we're going to ask them to keep their knees straight and then to extend backwards, like so. Thank you, and relax. And the muscles that are involved in lumbar spine extension are now for you to see on the screen. Okay, so now let's look at our P, Q, and R. Firstly, P, which stands for pain. As we said with lumbar spine flexion, lumbar spine extension is a multifactorial movement involving lots of different structures, and therefore it may be difficult to isolate what exactly is causing your patient's pain. However, we do know that lumbar spine extension is the closed pack position for the lumbar spine, and therefore you're putting pressure on the facet joints which are closing down. 
We also know that this may relate to degenerative lumbar spine conditions where your patient may very well like flexion but may not like extension. Next on to cue for quality. We're now going to show you a series of videos demonstrating different quality of movement for lumbar spine extension. In this first one, you can see that, that the patient is extending from a very specific point in the lumbar spine. This is commonly known as hinging and means that there is a lot of pressure going through specifically one part of the lumbar spine, which may be causing your patient's pain. In this second video, you can see that the patient is excessively extending through the hips, and this may demonstrate that they don't have good control between the lumbar spine and the pelvis, which is required for all kinds of activities, for example, walking. Now, in terms of range, you can measure range in different ways. If you want the degrees, the normal range of movement for lumbar spine extension is considered to be between 20 and 35 degrees. However, you could use different fractions, for example, a quarter range of movement, half range of movement, or full range of movement. So now we're going to look at side flexion in terms of lumbar spine active range of movement. For this test, again, our patient is going to be in a standing position. As the therapist, we would normally stand directly behind them so we could see exactly what's happening. But so that you can see at home, I'm going to be standing to the side here. So for the movement itself, we're going to ask our patient to put their hands on the outside of their thighs. We're then going to ask them to slide their hands down one thigh before coming back to the middle. And then we're going to ask them to slide their hand down the opposite side before coming back to the middle. And that's how we look at the movement. And the key muscles that are involved in side flexion of the lumbar spine are on the screen for you to see now. Okay, so let's get on to our P, Q and R. Firstly, starting with P, which is for pain. So it's important to note for the side flexion movement. If we ask our patient to side flex to the right, it is the eccentric control of the muscles on the contralateral side which are predominantly controlling this movement. So with that said, if people have pain with side flexion, it's most likely to be due to one of three things. The first is an irritation of the muscles on the contralateral side as they are controlling the movement eccentrically. The second problem could be due to uh, irritation of muscles on the same side which may be overactive and not relaxing as a part of the movement. Or third, it could be due to joint compression. It's important to note that if our patient's side flexes to the right, it is the right-sided facet joints that are closing down. So it may be that the uh, facet joint compression is causing their pain. Next, on to quality of movement. We've now got a series of videos demonstrating different ways in which your patient may side flex. The first one is demonstrating where the patient has a predominant hip shift or pelvic shift where they slide their pelvis across to the opposite side uh, that they're side flexing to and this could just be their preferred movement pattern. The second is where our patient is flexing as well as side flexing and this could be because they are trying to offload the facet joints as a part of the movement to make it more comfortable for themselves. And the third one is where our patient is side flexing predominantly from the thoracic spine and this is more likely to mean that the lumbar spine is not moving as a part of the movement and perhaps that's because it's too painful for them to do so. So have a look at those different things with your patient and consider if that might be a reason for their symptoms. Finally on to range. The normal range for side flexion of the lumbar spine is considered to be between 20 and 25 degrees. However, therapists may often choose to use different landmarks as a way of describing the side flexion. So if we ask our patient to side flex to the right, we could note that they're reaching halfway down their thigh, maybe they're reaching their knee joint, for example. And finally, if you do want to analyse the movement further, you could try and change it to see if it improves your patient's symptoms. So, for example, let's say that they do have that predominant hip shift as we talked about earlier, which would look like so. It could be that this is their preferred movement pattern. What you could do is ask your patient to side flex without the pelvic movement and see if that's painful or not. If it is painful, it may well be that the reason they do the pelvic shift is because they're trying to get out of pain. Now a quick note on combined movements. By combining movement in one plane with that in another plane can give us even more information about our patient's condition. An example of a combined movement may be asking our patient to extend their lumbar spine and hold the extension while side flexing to either the right or the left. So what extra information does this give us? 
Well, first of all, it can allow us to explore a particular functional activity in more detail. For example, a window cleaner may say he always has pain when cleaning the bottom of a large window on the right side, which we could interpret as lumbar flexion combined with right side flexion. We could thus explore this combined movement during our objective assessment and compare it to flexion with left side flexion. If flexion and right side flexion is more painful, this would match our patient's previous comment. Another reason for combined movements is to test joint and soft tissue structures under full stress. For example, as you saw during our introduction, extension and right side flexion will fully compress the right sided lumbar spine facet joints. Thus, if we perform this movement and it does not recreate our patient's pain, we can clear the right sided facet joints as a source of our patient's condition. Also, if we complete combined movement testing of the lumbar spine in addition to accessory movements through palpation and our patient's symptoms are not reproduced, we can effectively clear the lumbar spine as a source of our patient's pain. So here are the lumbar spine combined movements. First, you can see our patient performing the movement of extension combined with side flexion to the right, and then extension combined with side flexion to the left. Furthermore, you could turn this around and ask your patient to side flex before extending the lumbar spine to test all quadrants of the movement. Next, we have lumbar flexion combined with side flexion to the right, and then lumbar flexion combined with side flexion to the left. And again, you could turn this around and ask your patient to side flex before flexing their lumbar spine to test all quadrants of the movement. So let's summarize this video on active range of movement testing of the lumbar spine. Look at your patient's active range of movement in standing, testing lumbar spine flexion, extension, and side flexion to both the right and left sides, potentially adding in combined movements as well. Remember that you are looking out for P, Q and R, pain, quality and range. When you look out for change of quality mechanisms with each movement, see if you can change your patient's movement pattern and see how this influences their symptoms and therefore how it can influence your treatment. And that completes our video on active range of movement testing for the lumbar spine. Next, I'd like to suggest you have a look at our other videos within the Clinical Physio Catalogue for the lumbar spine, including observation of the lumbar spine and palpation of the lumbar spine. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you again soon, right here on Clinical Physio.